When Sabrina Bennett started out on the long journey from her home in New Hampshire to the boot mill in Lowell, Massachusetts in 1827, she had high hopes. Then, barely 17 years old, she wanted to earn enough money to feel independent, and she also wanted to help out her family. Factory work would be hard, she knew. It would require paying attention to clocks and time, adhering to a rigid schedule, and learning to obey the demands of supervisors and machines. She knew she'd be fined if she failed to adhere to the mill's tough standards. But she also knew that if she succeeded, she could help her family out and put by a bit of money herself. She was excited at the thought of earning a little extra cash. Sabrina offers an example of the economic transformation stimulated by the American Revolution. For alongside grand declarations about individual liberty and freedom from tyranny, lay challenges posed by more developed industrial nations. Britain and France threatened to flood the new nation with goods that would stifle American economic initiative. A way had to be found to create an economic foundation sturdy enough to protect citizens from both the armed might and the insidious trading pressures of other nations. To do this, Federalists such as Alexander Hamilton believed the United States had to develop what he called a balanced economy. In a society still almost totally agrarian, such views meant convincing an unwilling population that non-agricultural production was both desirable and necessary. No one wanted to threaten the society's agrarian base, and no one wanted to reproduce the poverty and degradation of English industrialism. There were many who believed that for all its positive values, an agrarian nation might lose its political independence if it could not survive in the economic marketplace. The first generation of Federalists sought to encourage individual entrepreneurs to invest capital in ways that would help the nation towards self-sufficiency by rewarding them with handsome profits. But industrial expansion required an efficient labor force, trained and willing to use new machinery under supervision. Who would produce the goods to be marketed? Who would spin the cotton? Who would weave the fabric that could be sewn into new clothing for sale in the western part of the new United States? Free white men in the northern and middle states had better options. They could migrate westward, where land ownership would provide them with the resources to become full citizens. By the early 19th century, the free white male might have argued that he owned property in his own labor and therefore deserved full citizenship. And if he were an artisan or a skilled journeyman, he might reasonably expect to become a household head in the near future. A decline in indentured servants after the revolution removed that source of labor. In the North, the demand for unskilled labor to build canals and roads, as well as a gradual emancipation of enslaved people, eliminated many potential factory workers. Nor was the South a good source of labor. It was losing a goodly portion of enslaved and free labor to new agricultural areas. The spread of cotton culture there would prove too attractive a use for enslaved people to release them for factory work. Between 1800 and 1860, the enslaved population expanded from one to about four million people, but few of the enslaved found their way into factories. Women like Sabrina Bennett seemed to be the best alternative. 